I'm, I'm ever so happy uh, to get our next speaker here. Um, and because for me, personally, it's been, it's been a block for a while that we haven't had uh, at Kissick, particularly, uh, a, a, a plenary who, who deals with feminism. And this is, this is uh, for me, it's been, it's, it's been a, a, a personal struggle, as well. I've seen uh, many who I've, I've spoken to, uh, how many all-male panels we still get to this day everywhere. And it's a, a, a frustrating, frustrating thing. And uh, I didn't want to get a thumbs up from David Hasselhoff uh, for this issue. And specifically to get uh, Kate Austin here is, is uh, a joy um, because she brings together all, all of these varied interests. Uh, my personal interest in, in Bacon uh, as, 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 well, as well as Shakespeare, but also uh, other important writers in the period, Afro Ben and um, uh, Middleton, Marston. Uh, her, her interest focused on, on the 7th century drama but, and, and bringing in uh, gender liter and literature, sexuality and literature, and performance culture. So she brings in a lot of these interesting uh, parts, which I can, for some reason, I consider theory uh, to, to many extent, but this is perhaps uh, doing the thing that you know we want to, want to do. Um, combining this, bringing uh, important issues from various angles. Um, well, Dr. Ortson is currently an academic program leader uh, for literature, media, and, and screen at Brighton University. She has authored uh, several books, uh, Renaissance Woman, uh, the English Renaissance, John Webster, The Tragedies, Afro Ben, The Comedies, and most recently, uh, Shakespeare, The Late Plays. And she's, uh, there'll, there'll be publications coming out on Afro Ben and um, uh, the 17th century women's poets and how they use uh, the, the, the topoi of uh, childbirth uh, as, as well as uh, a collaborative. Uh, project with other feminist scholars led by uh, Elaine Hobby. Uh, and this, this, is, this is, will be turning into the uh, uh, Afro Cambridge ben. complete, yes. The first yes. edition of all of Afro Men's work. Yeah, very which, which, which yeah. it, you know, it, it is about time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, please join me uh, in, in welcoming uh, Kate Orson. Okay, thanks, Tino. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I think this is a, a brilliant um, gathering that you've got going here, and I hope that we can continue to support it. Um, now, you gave that introduction about uh, feminism, and, and I, I guess when you first asked me, you kind of thought, well, she'll do something about feminism, and I, I did think that I would, and then I thought that I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, so uh, just uh, this paper for me marks a, a number of thresholds as well. Um, I kind of out myself as a novitiate, uh, Shakespearean in a way. Uh, I have written a little bit about Shakespeare, but I do write a lot of, about a lot of other things as well. Um, I'm currently, actually, which I forgot to, to mention to you, doing a, a collaborative book on Shakespeare and gender, so I could have taken something from that. Uh, but instead, I kind of moved sideways and started thinking about Shakespeare's beginnings, which is something I've thought a little bit about before, but I just wanted to explore it a little bit more. And so this really is a work in progress. It's just a set of uh, observations, really, and thoughts, and a lot of questions. <laughs> Maybe a few conclusions. Uh, Timo did say to, to be controversial. So, um, now, Shakespeare makes a lot of jokes about beginnings, as, as we know. Um, uh, in As You Like It, Lubeau says, I will tell you the beginning, and you may, if it please your ladyships, uh, you may see the end, and talking about a performance. Uh, Fest day and ague cheek in the... Um, the, the kitchen scene in Twelfth Night um, talk about this joke about hold thy peace and then they sing the song which is a catch which repeats and repeats and repeats that, that, that trope of hold thy peace but if he holds his peace he'll never begin um, and so that kind of intersection between performance, pleasure desire, anxiety and fulfilment it seems to me is comically condensed 
in fest days I shall never begin if I hold my peace. And I just like that to kind of hang over this uh, disquisition on beginnings. Now, uh, I foolishly didn't um, put this quotation on the slide because it's rather long. Uh, ben, what ben Jonson translating Horace in his Horace the Tsar's Poetica in Ben Jonson's Timbers, published in 1616. And he translates Horace in a particularly dramatic way. Um, to speak to me, muse, who after Troy was sacked, saw many towns and men, and could their manners track to treat. He thinks not how to give you smoke from light, but light from smoke. Okay, that, that, that light from smoke idea, I just want us to hold it in our heads. Blah, blah, blah. Nor Troy's sad end begins from the two eggs that did disclose the twins. He ever hastens to the end, and so, as if he knew it, wraps his hearer to the middle of his matter. Wraps his hearer. And I just think that translation of Horace by Johnson, po uh, dramatist poet, but a, a dramatist, just thinking about what an opening does. Wraps us to the beginning of the matter. All right. Now, beginnings are, of course, hard for us all, and everybody makes jokes about these kinds of things. Uh, we're nervous, we're anxious about the impression we might make. Who will see, who will hear? We stutter. And this physical and bodily response is echoed in the intellectual task when we commence to write. In addition, of course, the weight of other texts, the anxiety of influence, can prove overwhelming. In the theatre, the physical beginningness must merge with an intellectual verbal beginningness, the bodies and the physical beings of the actors, and the intellectual efforts of writers, producers, stagehands, have to, together, commence an orchestrated dance which also articulates a story, a set of events. A physical meeting of actors with the audience is also the beginning of a narrative. And so, in this way, theatre beginnings are more complex and layered than purely textual ones. And this seems to me, uh, since I can be controversial and just say what I like, uh, is something more easily, often more easily recognised by actors and directors and alert dramaturges than by literary critics. Um, the physical beingness of both stage and bodies makes the opening scene, the opening moments, the physical threshold for actors as well as a magical other world of invention and imagination for the audience. <clears throat> The doubleness intensifies the beginningness of theatre. Its very being is predicated on this meeting, the threshold of moving between two states, unknowing to knowing, stranger to friend, outsider to insider, disparate individuals to complicit audience, as we have just been talking about, actually. And so how do dramatic texts respond to that intellectual problematic? Now, um, I think the paper that we just heard before, which talked about those different theatrical spaces, uh, of the proscenium arch, which comes into play in the later 17th century, enabled actors to overcome that awkwardness of the beginning because there was a division, much more of a division, between stage space and audience. And lighting, of course, enables that beginning, that awkwardness to be overcome as well. Shakespeare doesn't have those technical conveniences, if you like, or technical um, uh, hurdles, depending on your point of view. Now, Ben Jonson, of course, talks in the uh, induction to the Every Man Out of His Humour of the, the formal thrice knocking of a staff, that the rapping that begins a performance. And he makes a very big, long joke out of that by putting bits of his induction on either sides of these knockings. Um, Shakespeare, of course, doesn't do that. He doesn't make that joke about beginnings. Uh, so textually and performatively, theatre and dramatists grasp the nettle of beginningness in early modern periods in a number of ways. And I just, I'm going to talk only about one of those ways here. So the first is the prologue, self-consciously, formally introduces us to the play and the actors. Um, the second is an induction, which frames the action, allows the beginning to be postponed by another narrative. Um, and of course, the final one is the opening scene itself. Now, Brewster and Wyman, in their masterly discussion of prologues, um, have summarised the, uh, the issues that come up in prologues uh, intellectually in the following way. Prologues were able to function as interactive, liminal, boundary-breaking entities that negotiated charged thresholds between and among, variously, playwrights, actors, 
characters, audience members, play world and the world outside the playhouse. However, Brewster and Wyman omit, it seems to me, three things, only one of which am I going to discuss today, but I just thought of it. They elide inductions into prologues, and I think that's a mistake. I think that we should be thinking about inductions separately to prologues. Um, they tend not to discuss Shakespeare's contemporaries, so Johnson and Marston's inductions, for example, and their prologues, which are uh, uh, very interesting, don't really feature in their discussion of those prologues, and I think that might change some of their conclusions, but again, that's just thinking. And then finally, they don't discuss that idea, the idea of the opening scene as a threshold. They see the prologue as a threshold. Once you've passed the prologue, you're in the play, uh, and they don't really look at that idea of the opening scene. So that's what I want to do. I want to look at the beginningness of opening scenes in a similar way, I suppose, or just keeping in mind Brewster and Wyman's ideas about uh, thresholds. How does the play playwright move us across into the play, move us across that threshold? And any opening scene has got to uh, perform the illusion of ushering an audience from their world into the world of the play's characters. And how does Shakespeare do that? And how does he do it across his career? And that's what I wanted to suggest. And I'm hoping that by doing that, we then open up or potentially open up larger questions about his politics and his dramaturgy. Now, a few other critics have written about Shakespeare's openings. Uh, Nuttall's excellent book, The Sense of the Beginning, has a few brief words about Shakespeare's beginnings in his epilogue, uh, but he's mainly looking at Shakespeare's tragedies. Um, but he does say this, this interesting, uh, he makes this interesting comment, um, he says that Shakespeare's plays are an entry not so much into the midst of known things as between things, or between whole orders of things. The ordinary indeterminacy of Elizabethan and Jacobean stagery, staging, sorry, with its rudimentary scenery and correlatively high demands upon the imagination of the audience is made the vehicle of an ontological indeterminacy. And he does quite a close cloak close analysis of the opening scene of Hamlet to demonstrate that. And I think that's an interesting thing to hold in mind, but uh, again, I'm not going to pause over it. Uh, finally, what do I mean by an opening scene? Uh, there have been a few books which <laughs> extend the idea of an opening scene into the whole of an opening act, and I think that's a mistake. I think we need to really focus on um, the quality of the, open the actual opening scene. Um, uh, the moment that we cross, cross over into the fiction and how that is framed, how that is formed. Polonius's uh, term, scene individable, which of course is mockingly <coughs> uh, put into Polonius's uh, mouth by Shakespeare, uh, nevertheless does seem to me to describe what an opening scene might be. We can't divide it into anything smaller. You know, we know when it begins and when that action that has happened in that scene is stopped, when the characters leave the stage or a new set of characters come on, that's that opening scene. Okay, so now I'm going to... Um, before I move on in detail, I'll just <laughs> show you some diagrams about numbers of the lengths of opening scenes in different playwrights. How am I doing on time? Very well. Yep. Okay, fine. Um, but first of all, just uh, with some caveats in terms of how I counted these. Now, um, where does an opening scene begin? <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but um, here's the uh, opening of Henry IV in the second part of Henry IV in the first folio. And it begins with what here is called induction, which is rumour coming on to the stage. Now, Brewster and Wyman call this a prologue. Uh, Hemings and Connell don't call it a prologue. Um, in fact, they are implying it's the first thing because what follows is sana secunda. Um, so when I'm counting through, looking at these opening scenes, I'm not dealing with editorial debates about how we might define these. I've just gone with what the first folio is saying, all right? So where it says something's a first scene, and I think implicitly this is a first scene, 
Uh, here, because the second scene is called Stena Secunda, that's what uh, I'm going to hold with for the moment. Um, equally, Taming of the Shrew, um, what is, again, editorially labelled as induction uh, in modern editions is actually Sena Prima in First Folio. So again, I've just... These are interesting things that I'm collab, sort of collecting, and I'm uh, going to add all of these things up in a second. Um, folio text omits the prologue from Romeo and Juliet and starts at one scene one with uh, the fight, the meeting and the fight. Um, however, Henry V, folio enters enter prologue, of course, famously, the court over Henry V doesn't have any of the choral elements in it. Uh, the cr- chorus is there also in the folio edition for Troilus and Cressida and Henry VIII. Um, so, in other words, where the first folio prints or acknowledges a prologue, it is set before the first scene. It is seen as outside the world in the play and closer to the play in the world, as Brewster and Wyman use that term. So, what are the features of these opening scenes? Uh, I'm going to look at four things very schematically. First of all, the length of these opening scenes. Second, the question of who speaks in opening scenes. Uh, thirdly, the patterning of those scenes across Shakespeare's career. And then finally, a bit more detailed discussion of some of the dramaturgical mechanisms of a couple of the late opening scenes as a way of drawing some conclusions. So, uh, in the first folio, Shakespeare's opening scenes, I just, what I was doing was looking at the length of these scenes. Because what interested me in particular, and I should probably say that up front, now is short scenes, short opening scenes. And I'm going to move towards that in a moment. Um, so, so, there you have um, just counted up. Again, uh, I've used the Oxford edition to count these scenes. Um, so, roughly uh, a quarter of his opening scenes are less than 100 lines, less than about six, seven minutes performance time. Um, And two-thirds were between 100 and 300 lines and a very small amount longer than that. If you include the prologues, that goes up a bit. So we again have this sense that uh, we have about a third of his plays under 100 lines, <coughs> about a quarter under 50 lines, again, that's quite tiny, um, across his career. Okay, so th- I'm going to do something with that in a bit, all right? Um, how does it compare with some of his contemporaries? Marlowe uh, doesn't write short scenes, <laughs> short opening scenes. Um, uh, writes quite a lot of long opening scenes, all right? Um, however, he does have prologues. Marlowe does have prologues. If you add the prologues in, you have that short opening moment. But the actual point at when you're in the play, he has quite a lengthy introduction. Uh, Marston. Again, quite a wordy, <laughs> quite a wordy uh, playwright. He uh, has very long opening scenes or and induction. Um, however, once you put a prologue in, again, he's shortening that introduction to the audience. Fewer than a quarter or more. Johnson. Now, Johnson's quite an interesting case. Um, That looks quite a varied pattern. It looks closer to Shakespeare in a way. Um, Without the prologues or the inductions, he's got uh, a lot of very short scenes and it looks like that's quite compelling. However, if you put the prologues in, actually what Johnson's mainly doing is putting his shortness into his pro- prologues and not his... So, so, sorry, just go back again. Although he has a lot of short opening scenes, first scenes, they tend to get dominated by the prologues. All right? So, although when you if, if you... if you perform one of Johnson's plays without the prologues or the inductions, you'll get a really great short scene if you perform it with some of the inductions and prologues, you don't get that same uh, immersion into the world of the play in terms of uh, shortness. Okay, now, uh, just a few uh, of the slightly uh, 
later playwrights in a way, I mean, not, not compared to Johnson, but we have uh, Middleton, Webster, and Beaumont and Fletcher. So Middleton plays without his prologues, again, has quite a few short scenes, a little bit closer to Shakespeare, but actually remarkably similar. And Webster, again, a fan of the short opening scene. But Beaumont and Fletcher, who, of course, uh, follow on Shakespeare as uh, the main writers for The King's Men. Um, so I don't know why I've written ten plays there, but I think I, I was using ten plays to <laughs> do that. Uh, uh, this is the, that blue. That's few, they don't have any. that are fewer than 50, by the way. I don't know whether that blue's coming up quite right, but that... Oh, it looks better on yours than it does on mine. Yeah. <laughs> They write much longer opening scenes. Okay, so that's... Uh, ooh, I'm not going to go on to that because that will give something away. Um, so that's really very enjoyable, me sitting down, crunching up numbers, thinking about the lengths of opening scenes. Uh, what might we conclude from that? Um, so prologues, with the exception of Johnson, who, it seems to me, prologues who don't use a prologue, with the exception of Johnson, uh, use shorter opening scenes. So it suggests that those opening scenes are kind of functioning in the same way that Bruce and Wyman might say a prologue does. Um, and then playwrights writing in the Jacobean period, uh, with the exception here of Beaumont and Fletcher, also favour those shorter opening scenes. So self-conscious use of short scenes in the place of prologues suggests dramatists structure openings to think about how that first moment of entrance onto the stage, the first engagement of the audience first dialogue between actors, actors and audience, has to perform perhaps in a similar way to the way a prologue does. Although not addressing the audience absolutely directly um, and rarely using explicit metatheatrical effects like inductions and prologues do. Um, okay, so what we're, the opening scenes we're discussing uh, are very much, in Brewster's terms, the world in the play. We've entered that fictional world. Okay, now, just the, the, this, this data in relation to the Jacobean period interested me as well, and I thought, well, what happens to Shakespeare across, Shakespeare's opening scenes across his career? Um, and so, I'm just reminding myself what I've got in there, um, including the prologues here, and then I'll look at one without the prologues, um, is basically in that first stage, early stage of his career when he's mainly writing those great big long history plays, of course, um, he doesn't have any short scenes. And then those short scenes, relative to the way other opening scenes work, these are only opening scenes, uh, become greater in number. And particularly after 1606, he has more plays with shorter scenes than with longer scenes. Um, oops, sorry. I should do that. What's it doing now? Where was I? <laughs> Let me just go back. Wait a minute. There we are. I was there. Right, fine. Um, I, sorry, just making sure, including prologues, yes. So I had taken out Pericles and Two Noble Kinsmen because they weren't in the portfolio, but I thought I'd put them back in. Actually makes that idea of the first uh, the, the initial scene as being something very short, quite obvious in those last plays again. Uh, if you take out the prologues, you know, for actually what I'm thinking about is opening scenes rather than prologues, and let's be fair, <laughs> let's not uh, interrupt the data there. Again, you still see that um, there's that movement towards uh, much shorter opening scenes relative to the other ones. Um, and it seems to me that what, he, what we can see from this is that he develops an interest in short opening scenes. What is it that a short opening scene gives him dramatically? Um, <clears throat> and that perhaps that's happening in the later part of his career. You know, that it is something that he learns, something that he improves on. Um, okay. Now, of course, there might be various reasons for this. Um, perhaps his collaborative, his competitive relationships with Webster and Middleton meant that together they felt that this was 
a workable, dramaturgical way of using their skills, of uh, engaging their audience. Um, and they learnt in an environment which was, as I say, both com competitive and collaborative, the value and the impact of the short scene, um, crossing both public and private theatres. Perhaps it's mere coincidence, of course, but I don't want it to be at the moment. Um, does this observation actually redraw the boundaries of what we might call the late place? Or indeed, what we might call late style? People actually have talked about uh, the structure of the plays, the way the language works, but not, not that dramaturgical opening. Does it mean we should actually go back to, and I'm going to just change the dates on this in a moment, to uh, 1606 to describe the late plays? Is Macbeth, rather than being one of the great tragedies, should it be seen as one of the late plays because of the way we see this move towards particular kinds of opening scenes? Shorter opening performance times, I would say, and particularly enhancing vi verbal and visual imagistic qualities of those openings. And I'll go on to talk about that in a bit. And before talking about a few scenes in great detail, I want to show another little... Uh, now, I could only fit this on one slide by making it so small that you probably can't see it. I don't know whether you can. What I was wanting to uh, now look at was... Um, uh, who speaks first? Who speaks in these opening scenes? But I mean, most particularly, who speaks first? And so, if just went through all the plays there, the left-hand column, if it's one of the main protagonists who speak, who open the play, I've put a little cross in it. Uh, if it's one of the main antagonists in uh, column two, and if it's an outsider, somebody who isn't central to the main action, or somebody of lower social status, I've put a cross in the front. Far column. And so what you should, what we see there, and I've um, put those plays in the list that the Oxford Shakespeare dates them in, all right? So obviously some of those things are still, are and will ever be contentious. Um, so, you know, there has been some debate, for example, about the dating of all 12 but then 12. And so uh, it's quite useful to follow the Shakespeare model here because it gives me this very lovely pattern uh, of what happens from about 1605 onwards, um, <clears throat> which is that all of those opening play, all of the all of those plays, the opening scene, uh, until we get to Henry VIII and Two Noble Kinsmen, which of course are collaborative, uh, all of those plays open not with the antagonist or the protagonist, but an outsider's voice. So that that is quite remarkable, isn't it? When you do a little bit of data crunching. Um, <clears throat> Opening with the outsider, the marginal, the crowd, sometimes with characters who take no further part in the action. Again, these are quite similar features to what we will find in a prologue or an induction. Um, but why is he moving towards this model? I mean, assuming that he knows you. Uh, and are these two sets of data that I've fiddled around with, are they related? Is the shortening of those opening scenes related at all to these alternative voices? Maybe, maybe not, but I'm just pretending that it is related. Um, <clears throat> we could, of course, argue that some of his earlier most successful plays, for example, Romeo and Juliet, um, Henry IV and Hamlet, do exactly the same. They start with those outsider voices. Maybe he's building, maybe he's recognising particular success uh, of his past practice. Um, or, you know, is his dramatic form simply echoing, to coin a phrase, uh, comically or tragically, a political strategy of transgression and containment? We transgress to start with, we show where we're going to cause a few problems, but that will all be shut down at the end. I'm not going to answer you that question. You can have a think about it for yourself. Um, uh, so, Brewster and Wyman have admirably debated how the prologue self-consciously characterises the ushering function of early modern drama, sweeping its audiences into the fiction, into the imaginary space that's on the stage. Across the threshold of the theatrical moment, easing our way into the fictional world and making 
almost explicit, this is the prologue, making almost explicit the actor's ambiguous Janus-like status as both servants of patronage and the audience and masters of their trade, their company, and the fiction to come. And this analysis may have relevance to these opening scenes as well, I think, and this is something I don't think Brewster and Wyman do. Uh, But I shall also argue more generally um, that the ontology of ushering in these last plays transforms itself to a more marked political dramaturgy. And so for the remainder of the lecture, just tell me how much I've got. Excellent. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be accelerating into this very quickly. Um, I want to do two things. Okay, consider uh, the nature of those <coughs> late scenes uh, uh, in a little bit more detail, just looking at who speaks um, and whose voices are represented and what that might mean. And then uh, finally, a, a little bit of a quick debate about the opening of two late plays, The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. Um, which experiment with dramatic scenic form uh, and with the opening as a philosophical problematic, I think. Um, And is he kind of saying, well, here's my solution, or here are two possible solutions in The Tempest and The Winter's Tale. And so almost as though uh, instead of Prospero's speech in The Tempest, which is supposedly about uh, in his, his view about his art and his aesthetic, maybe, maybe the practice of the opening scenes is actually a better way to think about what Shakespeare's saying about his drama. <laughs> okay, so just, just, I mean, probably you all know these, but I'm just you know, really reiterating this, um, this uh, extraordinary data, really, uh, and, and just moving through those plays. So All's Well That Ends Well begins, uh, uh, has the... Whatever the word is, I can't think of the word. Uh, well, the uniqueness of uh, being the only play that opens in a woman's voice, the Countess. Um, and, of course, not seen again until Aphrobane <laughs> writes her comedies of the 1670s and 1680s, and Aphrobane looking back to Shakespeare, very deliberately putting women on the stage in comic situations to, uh, to commence, to begin her, her, her work. Um, so how does this scene between uh, uh, the women and um, the servants uh, begin? It functions as a kind of prelude. I'm trying not to use the word prologue here. Uh, to the formal entrance of the king of France in the second scene. But it's, it's more pivotal, perhaps, than preludic. Maybe we shouldn't be using that term, prelude or prologue, because we're plunged, we're wrapped into it, you know. Um, so the Countess uh, gives her advice about uh, uh, their futures to Bertram and Helena. And Helena is then left alone on stage and her soliloquy uh, makes the audience complicit. She's alone on stage, she moves forward t- towards the audience. Uh, so the audience becomes complicit with her desire and her voice. So although it's the Countess that has begun the scene, it's, it's Helena who ends it. Um, and so by commencing the play through these female voices and linking the emergent narrative plot to Helena's design, Shakespeare's play echoes or speaks to the ordinary woman in the audience and suggests agency, even authority, can reside elsewhere than in the centre of political or gendered power. Or at the very least, that those without those powers can talk about those with power. They can articulate their own dispossession. And I think that's a common thing that we've come up to against in these opening scenes. They can articulate that dispossession. Uh, King Lear, when people are asked, how does King Lear begin with the division of the kingdoms? No, it doesn't begin with the division. It begins with um, Kent, Gloucester, and Edmund having a very low-key prose discussion about their situation in the court, about the um, jealousies between uh, the two dukes, Um, and delivered again, probably at the front of the stage, talking to the audience. What we see, what we hear, how we hear it, uh, all emphasise, it's in prose, it's quite low-key, all emphasise the in-betweenness of the moment, dramaturgically nodding to the nature of crossing a threshold through the experience, again, of these semi-outsiders. Now, of course, uh, Kent and Gloucester are part of the king's court, but they uh, are slightly set apart from it. 
So the chorus, sorry, the conversation acts as a choral prelude to the entrance of king and court, the division of the kingdom which follows. If we look forward to The Winter's Tale, I think what Shakespeare does, and I'm going to do that in a moment, is, is very obviously split that into two scenes and make the discussion between the courtiers, the, low, the slightly lowlier courtiers, um, pivotal as a scene in itself. So the point of view established by the opening is therefore that of outsiders to the main action. The commoners, in the case of Edmund and Kent, on national and courtly affairs. The opening voices create a perspective. And again, I think that, that's quite an important word, perspective, a way of seeing. And again, uh, what you were talking about in terms of those lines of perspective that, the, that you drew uh, for the audience was a, a great way of kind of illustrating precisely how that happened. They usher us into the action indirectly, slowly, less explicitly than a prologue, and upwards we enter in from those with a lower voice. Time in of Athens begins with a street meeting between poet, painter, jeweller, and a merchant as they're waiting Timon's entrance. So it looks as though we're just sort of hanging about waiting for the main action to begin, but actually this is quite crucial uh, to the meaning of the play. There's a mirroring of ourselves in the audience. The onstage audience for Timon look more like the offstage audience than Timon himself will do, and we too are waiting for the action to begin. The political gossip about Timon's rise to the top and the danger of political ambition act as a choral alert, and this word choral keeps coming up, not only because of content, but because of the placing of these comments in the voices of ordinary men at the beginning. That's what we first hear. Now, Macbeth, interesting. Um, again, I said that, was the, uh, that uh, All's Well That Ends Well was the only, voice, uh, the only play with women's voices. Of course, Macbeth is an exception to that. It, we have the voices of the witches. But they're not characters in the same way that the, uh, the characters of All's Well That Ends Well. Now, in Macbeth, the visual and the oral precede the physical entrance of the witches according to the stage direction. Of course, we don't actually know whether that's true, but we are literally wrapped to the middle of the mass of the thunder and the lightning appear. The appearance of the witches as witches, outsiders, supernatural beings, different, needs to be and is disturbing. The archaic rhythmic chanting and the assumption of knowledge and power evoke and establish a choral counterpoint to the action that follows. These women, however, unlike Helena, are demonized from the beginning. They utilize deliberate icons of evil, Grey Malcolm, Paddock Calls. This opening, whilst through the voices of the marginalized, are also self-professedly the voices of forces of disruption and disturbance, and much more so than any of the other opening plays that I'm talking about, I think. Antony and Cleopatra opens with Demetrius and Philo talking about Antony's state of mind, interrupted by the passage, probably behind them, otherwise how could they keep still be talking to us, of Antony and Cleopatra and their attendants. They enact a little bit of love business, uh, and a message comes from Rome, and they move off stage, probably in the other direction. Uh, and then uh, the scene closes on Demetrius and Philo's commentary on Antony's character. These two characters never appear explicitly again in the play. Of course, they may appear as part of the... Um, the armies of um, Antony. Uh, visually, they're onlookers on the action. They're at the front of the stage. They're looking at what happens uh, as Antony and Cleopatra. They parallel, again, our own watching, our passive status. <laughs> they give expression to their views, but nothing they say will change or does change how Antony behaves or his fate. And so the scene acts as a paradigm of our own watching, explicitly through the eyes of interested outsiders, interested ordinary people. <laughs> it encapsulates in miniature this beginning scene, the plot to come, pleasure and Egypt versus Roman duty, as well as the engagement of the onstage audience in that debate. So there we are, we're mirroring ourselves through that. I'm going to not talk about Pericles since uh, it's contested authorship thing. Um, Coriolanus opens uh, similarly to, uh, in the tradition of Shakespeare's other Roman plays, enter a company of mutinous citizens with staves, clubs, and other weapons, very similar to uh, the crowd scene in Julius Caesar. Uh, and citizens are on the street in active discussion about economic and political injustice. 
Noise, assertion, rapping dominate the opening, which is eventually calmed by the intervention, the debate with Menenius. Um, the opening scene thus establishes a voice of citizenry as a counterpoint to Martius's political and social ambition and attitudes. Uh, and again, that is our entrance point into the scene. Cymbeline, uh, like Leah, uh, has a two-part opening scene in which begins with two gentlemen talking before it opens out into that more formal um, uh, entrance of the Queen. The two men engage in political gossip, and particularly the gossip they talk about is their view of Inogen's secret marriage and the King's anger at Posthumus and his banishment of him. And they say, well, actually, we don't like the idea of the arranged marriage. We support Posthumus. Right? So, uh, so whilst simultaneously acting as a choral conveyor of key information, they establish and validate a culture in which ordinary gentlemen must outwardly approve of what power decides or thinks, but they can express their views and opposition. Uh, equally, because they open the play, and they open the play probably at the front of the stage, it reinforces their solidarity with the audience, with the wider audience watching the play. Perspective and point of view are thus created from an aslant position. Uh, and just think of the contrast, for example, with the way masks were performed and how the audience to the mask centered on the king. You know, there was one, the best view, to say the best. Um, right, the winter's tale, again, spoken by two courtiers who, although they serve their masters, are outsiders to positions of power and decision-making. Um, again, feels like a prelude to something that's about to happen, um, although both men talk about the fact that they're speaking in freedom, they're speaking with honesty. So what is being, you know, is, is this the nature of an opening scene? I'm going to talk in more detail <laughs> about uh, some of the, the structure of The Winter's Tale in a second. And finally, well, not quite finally, I'll talk about Henry VIII as well, uh, uh, the Tempest um, is often played with a huge number of special effects. And of course, it is an amazingly tempestuous opening. However, what is said is incredibly important, and who says it is incredibly important. Um, the bosun and the mariner are the first speakers. The courtiers come in afterwards. Um, the boatswain's shouting at the courtier at uh, Alonso and Gonzalo, what cares these roars for the name of king, explicitly articulates the perspective of the labourer on the pride and the idleness of those in power and the equality of everybody in the face of the tempestuous natural disaster that they're facing. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Finally, Henry VIII uh, returns very similarly to the earlier history plays and uh, starts with the rebels. So it's, it's not an outsider's voice, but it isn't a uh, protagonist's voice. So I'm now going to uh, very quickly move on to uh, talk about uh, both the Winter Tale and the Tempest in a little bit more detail. Um, Okay, so, firstly, the winter's tale, if we shall chance. That's how it opens, if we shall chance. And what this, if, what this introduces to the play is the idea of risk and uncertainty, if, if you shall chance, hazard. And this hypothesized, I can't say that word, uh, opening and the language of hazard echoes insistently through this opening scene, that if, if we still should have. Um, Victor Turner's idea describes um, a liminoid theatre as being in the subjunctive mood. If, what would, if this thing might happen. And it's almost as though Shakespeare, in The Winter's Tale, in this opening scene, has kind of grasped that. If these things should happen, I should begin to do that. And um, <coughs> Archidamus actually... This last sentence as well is also an if, if the king, if, if the boy should die, 
what is it? What's the actual word? Um, lost that because I'm trying to accelerate through here. Um, if the king had no son, that's right. Uh, they would desire to live on cliffs, if the king. So using hypothecated language to structure this scene, imagining what might be, even no matter how disastrous it is, rehearses the possibilities of this fiction, articulates that idea of rehearsal, of ifness, of subjunctive possibility. And the whole scene is framed by the ifness of this stranger. Archidamus doesn't have another role in the winter's tale. He's on doesn't appear again, and yet he has this, this framing of these solicitors. So politics and potential story and future are absent and present in the beginning of The Winter's Tale. The subjects of the conversation, the rulers, are all off stage, and the absence establishes a tension about what's going to happen next um, and uh, the nature of what is going to happen next because Camillo's language deteriorates into a set of hypotheticals and subjunctive sub-clauses. Sub and if we do a close analysis, it's, it's quite interesting. So the language and the form of the scene and the structure of the scene connotes a threshold. And it's almost as though this scene is a paradigm of an opening scene, even though it's incredibly short. Equally, the Tempest, another short scene, but within the space of these perhaps six minutes of performed time, there is much simultaneous action and stage business. The characters rush off and on stage. Um, there, if you actually break up the scenic moments within the scene, there are seven definable moments which are juxtaposed against each other. So that tells you how fast movement between characters and across the stage is. Each of those moments itself wraps the audience, perhaps wrapped us as well. And particularly the boatswain interests me. His physical movement onto and off stage is equal to his time on stage is equal to that of the courtiers. His, his dialogue is addressed to every single member of the ship and to the courtiers as well. So he's controlling not only the space of the stage, but the conversations on the stage. Now the boatswain was actually a middleman. He's not the master of the ship. And Alonso keeps calling for the master of the ship. The boatswain says, no, the master's off stage, off doing something else. It's me you have to talk to. Uh, but he manages the mariners, the equipment, the supplies for the effective running of a ship. Um, he, his serving status, his status as a servant is established at the beginning when the master says, boatswain, and he says, yes, master. Right. However, the boatswain is the person who manages the ship, manages also what is on stage. Um, So his, what cares these roarers for the name of king? What cares these roarers, the, the waves and the uh, tempest, um, radically suggests differences of class and status and niceties which prevent the physical salvation of the boat. Only those with professional knowledge can save the boat, the drama, and the lives of those on board. If you can command these elements to silence, use your authority. By invoking the word authority with such irony, the Boson simultaneously, implicitly asserts his own authority and asks questions about other political authority, particularly Alonso. And that, of course, raises broader philosophical and political issues that may have um, relevance for a wider discussion that I don't have time for here. Um, okay, so where am I at? Shall I? Uh, a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes, okay, that's fine. The voices and presidents of the mariners in this opening scene as well is quite important because we don't hear them other than as choral voices. They speak together. So it's textually marginal, yet central to the whole action. Um, the mariners only speak directly once, all lost to prayers to prayers, all lost. And that, scene, that line marks the scene's key turning point as it announces the ship's nil. We've seen the mariners laboring throughout the scene on the boatswain's instructions. He's giving them orders, so we must be able to see them if, even if we don't hear them. Um, and the anonymous cries that come from offstage are from both the mariners and the passengers, set now indistinguishable. They have joined together, as uh, the boatswain says, what cares these roarers for the name of the king. As the ship goes down, all men are the same. So the scene's action replicates the boatswain's implicit social and political insight. When the laborers stop working, the world literally falls apart. The scene, of course, ends on Gonzalo's dream of a dry, dry acre of land, of what might be, and merges into, uh, at one scene, two, where Miranda says, if 
by your art. And so again, that subjunctive point that if uh, has uh, emerged into Shakespeare's opening scene, or the edge of his opening scene. Okay, so conclusions very, very briefly. Um, so very clear that those late plays uh, from about 1605 to the opening is hosted by characters who are not subsequently featured as main characters. So we're provided with an oblique window into the world of the play. But it also establishes and legitimizes an outsider perspective on the action that is to come, but also as a general philosophical stance. Of course, you could argue that by using marginal or marginalized characters at the beginning, Shakespeare's just waiting for us all to stop chewing our popcorn or staring down the dress of the woman in front of us. Um, but I think that these beginnings are more than accidental. The outsider perspective invites a skeptical and inquiring audience, always aware that it is outside the action, even when it becomes most intense. Characters who hold power are displaced. Power is literally questioned by the structural organization of the play's opening, although, of course, that position is challenged by subsequent action and narratives. Putnam, in his Art of English Poesy, spoke about pastoral eclogues, how poets, under the veil of homely persons and in rude speeches, insinuate and glance at greater matters. And so what I'd suggest is the idea of both the humbler characters and the opening scene itself glancing at greater matters suggests a fusion of politics and aesthetics. Equally, by placing this perspective at the opening, it becomes memorable as the first bars to a favorite piece of music. The tone and the flavor of this perspective are our entryway into it. Okay, um, just some other thoughts I had as I was doing this, and I haven't been able to incorporate it anywhere into it, but um, just thinking about uh, Shakespeare's debt to Plautus, 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 kind of, uh, where, who always has the slave speaking the prologue. And again, that, that kind of tradition of the lower voice, that lowly voice ushering us in. I wondered whether that was important. And then the other thing that I wanted to um, think about, which I hadn't really done, is that is to look back at Shakespeare's sources, and I'm pretty sure that those opening scenes that we're talking about are Shakespeare's inventions. You know, these are not what he takes from his sources, the opening scenes of the, of the later plays. Um, but again, that can be perhaps something that somebody else could chase up for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, fantastic talk. And in, uh, I really like the way in which you brought uh, Shakespeare's changing form in, into uh, kind of bringing out this out outsider yeah. view. It's, it's very, very, very intriguing. This sounds like there's this sort of proto uh, referendums effect, you know, proto Brechtian mood, yeah. in which making people aware of the medium of, of, of knowing that um, challenging that idea of, of what's happening and making you know, the play even more uh, dialectical in the sense that it can do more yeah. within it. Um, but um, um, instead of me just yammering on uh, about, uh, uh, we have some questions. Uh, uh, Christian. Yes, thank you. Um, I enjoyed your paper. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about openings. Simply from a literary critical point of view, I've always been interested in the first words. Yep. And so I have two questions. One question is, do you think that looking at simply the first words yep. can tell us something about the play? Yep. And then the second question from uh, the point of view of um, philosophy, specifically Hegel. So Hegel's very interested in the beginning, the um, right, what's going on in the beginning. Um, and one of the things he comes to in the science of logic is that at the beginning, where you have pure being, you also have pure nothing. You can't have either one without the other. So you have this immediate is more than a You have this movement that's constantly happening. But in describing that, he must start with something. He must start with pure being when he's using words, okay? which ends up being incorrect. Okay? But I have this thought that art, and in this case theater, can depict that beginning that is not a beginning, that beginning that is simultaneously dialectically negated. And it seems that some of what you're talking yeah. about here might point towards. Yeah, that's what you mean. Yeah, as a first point thing, well, obviously, I, you know, I've just thought of this very recently, but I do think there could be something in that. Mm -hmm. But I think because as I started looking at this term, that that if, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's so resonant, isn't it, that all the whole of the way. <laughs> 
both the plays, these opening scenes, actually more so than the prologues, which I think almost too artful. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, the, the, the opening scenes, Shakespeare particularly, I think, as he moves towards the end of his career or halfway through his career, is thinking about that, you know, how do I articulate that given moment and what does it look like? And particularly with words are very different to say to say a piece of art, but you know, you're separate from what's been into it. Um, yeah, I mean I didn't think that, 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 that might work for you. Oh excellent. Now we, we have our, our first Ildico and then Richard. Written. I think you've opened the door to one extraordinary powerful holistic tool. Um, one of the ways in which I think um, your analysis, particularly of what you call the ontology of ashery, might help us to think uh, more closely about Shakespeare's dramaturgy is the way that it seems to introduce and um, uh, to proceed Shakespeare's own metatheatrical self dramatization as an unperfect actor on the stage, forever on the threshold. An intro, which obviously has to do with his class relationship, um, his servants in relation to his patronage uh, economy, but um, in particular, I think, opens um, the door onto the whole question of the Shakespearean pause, the hesitation that uh, is built, obviously, particularly into Hamlet, but you might say into the entire yeah. dramatic structure. Yeah. I think you're quite right to focus on the significance in this narrative of Antony and Cleopatra. Which does seem, in many respects, um, um, theatre historians like Andy Gerr have done a lot of work on this, to correspond to the, the, the inception of a proscenium theatre. It may even have been performed at Whitehall with the triple pillars uh, constructed by Inigo Jones remaining in place. And the sense in which that opening moment, where the supercilious courtier Philo asked us to observe the triple pillar of the world transformed into a strumpet's fool, seems to be one that is under pressure in that Shakespearean uh, questioning of the proscenium perspective. Yeah. In, in, in ways that I think quite closely relate to what's happening in the visual arts at the same moment. Yeah. The theatre director who's been most influenced by the law, if you like, Formalist approach to the uh, to dramaturgy of Jonathan Miller. Yeah. Miller was very preoccupied by the parallel between a character like Philo and what I believe in art, or what he told us in art history is called the Sprechmeister, yeah. the figure at the front of the canvas who points to yeah. the canvas within, and he used this a great deal yeah. in his Shakespearean productions, the ones from the BBC, yeah. as well as his yeah. other performances. Yeah. Um, but so I think what you've asked us to think about really is, is the extent to which Shakespeare interrogates those openings, particularly when they are related to an entire politics of theatre as it's developing around the court yeah, in the 1600s. The dialectic of that, that, that Timo made 
So I think my, if, if I had a question, and I'm moving towards it, it would be, uh, what do you think these openings tell us then about Shakespeare's sense of an ending? Because uh, a large issue in terms of Shakespeare's new characteristically bipolar structure, in which we move into the Greenwood, into the forest, and then return at the end, but transform, never the same as we were at the beginning. Have you been thinking yourself about Shakespeare's sense of an ending well, in relation to your analysis? I haven't thought, I haven't for this, I have to say that. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that at the end, that Prosper is actually all speaks again to the audience, and that seems to me to bring us back in some ways to that opening scene in a way that I think a lot of critics don't acknowledge. They see it much more in terms of prosperous with power and his alliance to James and you know, magic and politics and theology. But um, actually, he's again talking directly to the audience, and there it seems to me that's a kind of more democratic circle that Prospero is making the character of Prospero, the actor. The kings of Megan, I would say. So. Yes. Give me your hands, and we'll be friends. Yeah. Time for uh, one quick question. Dom? In, in, um, at, at school, when one learns uh, Shakespeare and so on, the, the, the classic literary term, in medio re, is yes. often used to describe sort of being dropped in the middle of the action. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you didn't use didn't that use at all. No, no. Um, and you did early on in your lecture point out that you were thinking about, in a way, being in between two states. So in a way, it's the, the, the threshold, you're going right into the threshold, yeah. rather than going into the, yeah. into the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that uh, utterly purposeful, as it were? Um, yeah, I, I did avoid using the immediate yeah. phrase, um, partly because it's often used, actually, to apply to every poetry. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's all about poetry, not about drama. Um, which is why I knew Johnson's translation, because I think he said it's Um, yeah, so, and, and the other thing that was apparent to me as I was writing was, was, you know, that actually what we're plunging into is the middling sort, like, you know, to, <laughs> the, the, those who are not the great and good, or, or even the lowest, or the audience, um, and that even, the, you know, that, that there's almost a joke there, isn't there, in Shakespeare, kind of thinking of the invidious race, but actually I'm going to locate it in these sorts of people. Um, and so I think I think Chaitin doesn't often put us in Midius race, it puts us outside the race, you know, <laughs> on the margins, more on the threshold than right in the middle, in these later in these later in which it just kind of falls into You notice the, the most tragic loss in Shakespeare is the disappearance of Christopher Sly. <laughs> much for this uh, in, engaging uh, talk and I um, hope everyone will uh, join me in thanking Kate for a fantastic talk. Thanks, Neil.